about my United's comeback win against Aston Villa. I'm glad I wasn't well enough because I had a feeling and most United fans would sense had a feeling that this was a fluke result. And if you actually watched the game um, United played against Villa, you would have known that Villa really played more into our hands as opposed to us playing really well. I think the thing about Man United that people don't understand is that we are a terrible football team, but we do have individuals on their day who can win us football games, which is why our fan base re you know, refers to us as individual brilliance FC. That's what we're referred to as commonly because we do have players individually who can win us games. So if you give those players chances, they will punish you. That's the thing about Man United. But if you beat us in terms of, you know, having a cohesive style of play, if you kind of kill the game, if you, you know, get a massive head start in terms of goals, there's no there's no way we're going to fight back. But if you give us a window, an opportunity to get some goals in, we're obviously going to take them. So that's what basically happened at Aston Villa. Aston Villa maybe were a little bit too confident, maybe a little bit too arrogant because of how poorly we've been playing and how well they've been playing. And obviously our comparative league positions, they got two, they got two goal leads head start and they kind of took their foot off the pedal um, they also kept defending with that high line and they just invited pressure from us really and that ball over the top that ball down the flanks was always on and we exploited it and obviously we were able um, to claw back the 3-2 win and of course the main point of it I thought was the main point to kind of like you know be happy about was more so the Rasmus Hoyland goal his first goal in the Premier League as you can see here when against Villa he was incredibly ecstatic about it really happy for him um, because you know he's literally playing in one of the worst positions you can play for United being up front I think the second worst position is maybe being United goalkeeper maybe a fullback or a midfielder um, just anywhere around the pitch for United is fucking horrible but playing up front for Man United is a real thankless task so he doesn't get much service um, there's a stat that came out recently that he gets the least amount of service of most top strikers in the European leagues and in general it's been a really 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 um, hard slog for him settling into the Premier League so him scoring a goal against Villa was great for him personally um, and the way he finished it as well um, the ball kind of bouncing back at him and then you know no no bounce no nothing straight volley um, side foot into the flipping um, you know right inside of the goal out, out stretch of the goalkeeper brilliant finish happy about that but overall I wasn't too giddy about his performance I'm not going to lie happy about us having a comeback and stuff and obviously watching it as a fan but this wasn't indicative of us kind of you know kickstarting our season because we didn't play well we allowed Villa to get a two goal lead head start without much effort and um, they didn't really have to even to come out of second or third gear I don't think to even get that league start and if anything if Villa didn't take their fourth the pedal if they were a little bit more conservative in how they played in the second half if they maybe tightened up defensively they could have easily won that game you know 4-0 if they wanted to but they kept giving us openings and we punished them cool then that brought us obviously to this week's game against Nottingham Forest and a lot of people were assuming that we were going to win this game also because of the previous game against Aston Villa. But I wasn't too certain because Forrest have got a new manager in Nuno Espirito Santo. Most of you would know him from his time at Wolves. Um, I think he unfortunately got fired from, I think, a job in the Middle East. So he came back, um, obviously, to the UK after Steve Cooper and Nuno Forrest was, was sacked. And I was always of the assertion that Nuno and Forrest are in a bit of a false position in the league because they've got a decent squad. They've got the right mix of personalities. They've got the right mix of profiles of players from players who have maybe been let go from other top clubs, like, you know, Alangas to like up and coming players who are trying to make a name for themselves, who obviously are using Nottingham Forest as like a springboard to go and play for another top European club, like, you know, the Danilos, the Marillos and stuff. They have a good mix of players who I think on their day could actually give most teams in the league a run for their money and could actually finish a lot higher than what they currently are. So I thought all they need is obviously a manager just to get the right combination right and so far Nuno has got the combination spot on he's you know got the best out of what he's had available they're still playing that transitional counter-attacking football that they're kind of known for and if anything they just exploited all of our weaknesses when it comes to the transition because obviously for some reason Ericsson Hag is continuing to persist with this single pivot so the single pivot this time was Kobe Mino. Um, sometimes it's, it's Scott McTominay, but he always persists with a single pivot. And the problem with a single pivot is that when you have runners in the likes of Ilanga, um, Dominguez, Gibbs White running in behind, there are too many players for that single pivot to cover. And obviously with fullbacks or sorry, with attacking wingers like Garnacho and Anthony, um, especially Garnacho who don't track back, you're going to have loads of open spaces where these players can run into and obviously exploit, which ended up happening in terms of both for the goals I think so so I was not that confident 
before the game I honestly did think it was going to be a tough one but I didn't expect it to be such a bad game to watch objectively the first half was a complete no show um the lesser about that the better I think I legitimately must have fell asleep two or three times um trying to watch the first half the second half obviously everything kicked off by then but I definitely feel like you know, the goal that even we got from Nottingham Forest was more so because of Matt Turner's inability to pass out from the back as opposed to us actually constructing anything of a decent attacking flow. And even the statistics are really strange. If you look at the statistics on here via Google, it says here that we had 10 shots. It doesn't feel like we had 10 shots at all. That's why I mean statistics aren't really the be on end of games you have to just watch them with your own eyes because it didn't feel like a 10 shot to eight game and it, it seems like we had more shots on target five to their two we had more possessions 55 to their 45 but they looked way more dangerous they looked way more cohesive they looked way more like they had a plan um you know their attacking um formation or their attacking patterns made a lot of sense i've been a big fan of yates in midfield he carries and runs the ball very very well in there danilo is starting to settle in a bit more at the club as well gives white is becoming a big player and of course Ilanga after leaving United um, you know which I think was a bit hasty even though I wasn't the biggest fan of his I still think he would have been a decent squad player he definitely had a point to prove and he definitely proved it by giving the assist to um, Gibbs White to score the winner and in general the kind of real sort of alarming point about this game was just uh, another reminder of just how terrible Eric Ten Hag's in-game management is for some reason in the second half he decided tactically that Kobe Minor wasn't the right player to play as a single pivot against Nottingham Forest and their fucked dynamic attacking midfielders and attacking strikers and shit so instead he brought on McTominay McTominay was a person that he thought would be the one to kind of you know plug that hole in the center of midfield now I'm not saying Kobe Minor was impressive he wasn't that great but I still think he probably could have lended it to maybe take off an Ericsson or take off a Bruno and stick two of those players in front of the defenders instead of just swapping out one. Because the one thing about McTominay is that he goes wandering and he's not defensively disciplined to stay in that position. So he went wandering, wasn't defensively disciplined, bit naive, following the ball. And essentially that's what led to the second goal. And it was so obvious a turning point in the game even myself again a non-coach a random nobody could see that the moment Scott McTominay came on the pitch and we you know changed the the sort of formation of our midfield and the profile it immediately swung the favor into Nottingham Forest and what they were doing that's essentially what happened and even though they deserve to win um, I think if anybody was going to win that game it was definitely going to be Nottingham Forest they had a lot more I think attacking intent they, they knew kind of what they were doing they're trying to exploit some of our spaces and shit I still think that's substitution was so unnecessary so unneeded and if anything played in the hands of not in the forest that it was another illustration of just how terrible um eric ten Hag's tenure has been so far and the amount of losses that we've kind of racked up and the unfortunate records we're breaking now is just really really startling and it's starting to get worrying it's starting to get really worrying because you're starting to think to yourself why is he purposely making these mistakes again and again and again? Why is he betting on players who are not turning up for him? Why is he putting all his faith on people who have not shown any level of repaying that faith that he's putting them? Like even the Antonys, even the, you know, even for lack of a better term, even the rap, the Rashfords, right? Um, the Bruno Fernandes, um, the Scott McTominays, of course, all these players who consistently play for Man United, consistently play for Eric Ten Hag, but consistently keep letting him down and he consistently keeps picking them. When the, and we all know what the reality is. Sooner or later, these guys are going to shit the bed if they haven't already. And then they're going to cost him his job and he will have no one else to blame. He will have absolutely no one else to blame. But again, a really shocking performance. Um, at the end, there was extra 10 minutes added and it didn't matter if they added another hour into that game. We were never going to score from open play. It would have taken a, a fluky free kick or a penalty for us to level that game or even win it. It was never going to happen. Terrible, terrible performance. And if anything, this 2-1 win, sorry, this 2-1 loss away from home against Nottingham Forest was more representative of where we are at as a team, as a football club, than that rousing comeback win against Villa. The rousing comeback win against Aston Villa was more so Villa playing into our hands and our players maybe feeling a little bit embarrassed um, and also maybe a little bit aware that the Ineos team were watching the team and stuff as opposed to us being a really fluid team the way we played again not in the forest is more indicative of where we are at. and if it was up to me if it was up to me and you had to ask me what I would wish for I would actually wish for us to get relegated 
I'm not going to lie. I would wish for us to get absolutely relegated so that the Glazers would leave and that we could start again from scratch. Because at the moment, I don't see any real light in the tunnel. This 25% ownership thing with Enios is a hot, is a load of bullshit. The Glazers have been charged for what, near on two decades for anybody to sit there and believe that they're going to allow Ineos to have, you know, unfretted, unrivaled sporting decision, um, you know, responsibility on the club when they've been running the shots or calling the shots for 20 plus years is ludicrous. That's not going to happen. And if it is going to happen, it's going to take a long, long time for them to slowly, if but surely, relinquish control. Because if they relinquish control and take off the reins on the sporting side of success of the team and it is successful, all the praise will be going to Ineos and not to the Glazers. And they don't want that. They don't want to be told they're doing a bad job. And they don't also want the people that are coming in and investing to get all the praise for it. That's not going to happen. I'm not, I've got no faith in that. And I'm not giving anyone the benefit of the doubt. And I've always said with United, unless we get rid of the Glazers, the only other hope that we have of ever getting back to where we were previously is if we're able to maybe find another Sargis Ferguson level manager. If we can find another SAF, which again is nigh on impossible, that's the only way that we're going to be able to get back to where we were. Other, other, apart from that, getting other managers and players and signings, it's going to be, it's a nonsense with these, with, with this ownership. It doesn't go anywhere because there's no accountability. There's no consequences. Um, and if anything, the objectives of the club aren't really, you know, aren't really sporting they're more commercial so it's no surprise that Ericsson Hag is still in the job now because until we're mathematic sorry until we're mathematically out of the top four race he's going to be in the job as soon as he's out he's going to get sacked because they want to obviously um, make sure that we get top four football which again is to the detriment of the players to the detriment of the fans because we're going to have to watch turgid football until the moment that he leaves and the club's going to have to bleed itself dry until that time instead of making the decision now to kind of freshen things up again before the flipping summer window but we don't we're going to wait until the very last minute to pull the trigger which you know we would know it's going to happen he's a dead man walking so clearly that's the main issue is going on at hand and of course you know as a manager to put him on one side of the favor of Ericsson Hogg his hands are tied behind his back because he also can't sell players as easily as many other managers and you know other top clubs can because the club has a weird way with how they deal with contracts with how they sell um, obviously he can't maybe get all the targets that he wants which you know no, no manager does but it's very difficult if you want to play a certain way of football and you can't get your number one targets and you can't sell the players that can't play the football that you want so then you have to rely on them during the season when other players get injured and that creates a weird imbalance but one thing that I think is a really glaring glaring thing about Ericsson Hogg's tenure so far has been his reluctance to rotate the squad and his reluctance to drop certain members of the team like, why does Bruno Fernandes start every single game? Why doesn't he ever come off as a substitute? Why has Onana never been dropped? Why? Why is that the case? Can people tell me? Why is that the case? Why does Anthony never get the same treatment that, you know, flipping Sancho was getting early on in the season when he was getting, you know, taken off every single game at a certain number of minutes? This is the reason that I think partly is going on at United that's kind of festering this bad, toxic environment at the club where certain players are allowed to get away with murder and certain players aren't. And, you know, if you're turning up to training every single week and you know certain players are going to play, what's the point of putting in your best effort? What's the point of putting in your best foot forward if you know most likely the same players are going to keep playing? Doesn't make any sense, does it? So whatever. Um, again, we go into the new year, um, you know, same shit as always with United. I don't really give a fuck. Um, let's see how it transpires. Let's see how it transpires.